My personal belief is that the clear wing moths are probably at the level of the flat-headed borers in terms of the damage they collectively do to our landscape plants. The main difference is that clear wing borers tend to slowly do their damage with infested plants simply showing slow growth or bark damage that is often mistaken for canker diseases or other maladies. I'm constantly telling homeowners that it isn't bark beetles that kill their flowering plum or flowering cherry trees, it was the peach tree borer. Because of their importance, we'll take part of the next module to completely cover these borers. The peach tree borer is one of our most common clear wing borers. It is not only a major fruit orchard pest where it attacks prunus species such as cherry, plum, apricot, and peach, it also attacks the ornamental flowering versions of these plants. Unfortunately, the landscape trees often have their bases covered with mulch, which makes an ideal environment for survival and development of this pest as well as it masks its activities. The larvae generally attack host trees just below the ground level at the root flare. The larva burrows into the phloem and cambium zone. Healthy plants usually produce abundant jelly-like masses where the vascular bundles have been severed. Often, the only sign of attack is the appearance of the pupil cases in the spring and discoloration of the soil immediately around the bases of the tree. Some years ago, I had a lady who planted about 75 native sand plums on a hillside, having heard that the native plants were better plants to have. The next year, over half of the small trees had died and each one had a nearly mature peach tree borer under the bark. Repeated attacks on larger trees can eventually overwhelm its ability to heal the damage and sudden death can occur once girdling is completed. Like most of the clear wings, the male peach tree borer can be quite different than the female in color markings and size. In the case of the peach tree borer, the male is a slender moth that is a steel blue color with some yellow markings. The female, however, is a blue black color with a conspicuous orange band across the abdomen. Clearwing moth larvae are difficult to identify to species and most simply identify them according to the host plant that they were found in. This usually works, but in some cases there can be more than one clearwing moth that attacks a species of plant. The larvae are generally robust caterpillars that appear white or light cream color. The head capsule will be brown. When turned over, the pairs of ventral crochets easily separate these larvae from the similar robust longhorn beetle larvae. Since the peach tree borer is a major fruit orchard pest, there has been considerable effort made to develop management programs to control this pest. The primary development has been the identification of the sex pheromones that females use to attract males for mating. These pheromones have been synthesized and are easily available. The pheromones can be placed in several types of traps, but one of the easiest to use is the delta wing sticky trap. The pheromone capsule or strip is attached to the underside of the top of the trap and the bottom piece of the trap is covered with sticky material. When a male detects the pheromone, he will fly to the trap, enter it, and as he bumps around inside, he will soon get stuck in the sticky goo. The trap should be inspected every few days because males emerge about a week to 10 days before the females. This will give the manager a few days to prepare for treatments. Treatments usually involve spraying the base of susceptible trees with a residual active insecticide. Since adults can emerge over a long period of time, the trap is inspected again when the insecticide residual activity is expected to stop. If adults are still being trapped, another insecticide application can be made. Some landscape management companies use these traps to time treatments for flowering prunus plants. The lesser peach tree borer looks a lot like the peach tree borer male, but it is a bit smaller. 
This clearwing specializes in attacking the same prunus plants, but it tends to attack branches and trunk areas above ground. It is most commonly found infesting graft junctions. It is one of the major reasons why top grafted weeping flowering cherry trees lose some of their branches or the grafted branches break out in storms. They also commonly occur where a branch has been pruned out. The callus tissues that attempt to cover the prune spot are very attractive. When the larvae burrow into these tissues, a sticky glob of sap material is often formed. The glob starts out as a transparent amber mass, but soon dries down to a harder crusty material. As the larvae burrow, the mass becomes filled with frass pellets. Again, there are pheromone traps that can be used to monitor the flight period of this pest and multiple preventive treatments are usually needed. The dogwood borer has always been a major pest of the native flowering dogwood trees. However, their name belies the fact that they have been found attacking a wide array of deciduous trees and shrubs. Like the lesser peach tree borer, this pest seems to be attracted to callus tissues that form after tree wounds or around graft junctions. It is a small species with the adults being about three quarters of an inch in length or smaller. Both males and females are a steel blue color and both have some yellow bands on the abdomens, though the female has one broad yellow band. On flowering dogwoods planted in full sun, the dogwood borer damage often causes the tissues to die and patches of the bark will fall away. This is one of the most common symptoms seen on flowering dogwoods. Unfortunately, the females will continue to lay eggs on or around this damage, which causes the damage to continue. I picked this picture to show what dogwood borer attack looks like when it is beginning and patches of bark haven't fallen off. Notice that the bark on the left has some rough areas. Normally dogwood trunk should be smooth and this suggests that the callus tissues have formed under the bark. The middle trunk is also showing evidence of sap flow with frass pellets. This can often be mistaken for sap flow from a canker disease, but cankering fungi don't make frass pellets. Female dogwood borers concentrate on attaching their eggs where there is some evidence of plant damage. This can be a lawnmower nick, poor pruning, or previous damage done by the borer. The larvae burrow into the phloem and cambium zones under the bark and produce granular frass pellets. These are expelled from the burrows. Again, there is a pheromone trap for this insect that it can prove timing of insecticide treatments but avoiding plant damage is a better strategy. Also, it's a good practice to plant the shade-loving flowering dogwoods in shady places, not in the open sun. The lilac borer adult looks a lot like one of the Polistes wasps. Polistes wasps are the social wasps that make those umbrella-shaped nests under the eaves of buildings. The lilac borer is sometimes called the lilac ash borer because the pest will commonly attack small branches of both common lilacs and ash trees. The larvae burrow into the stems that are usually an inch in diameter or less. They move into the middle of the pithy stems where they feed on the wooden fibers. Their activity is often missed until the branch or stem suddenly breaks in a windstorm. The infested stems often have a nodule of hardened sap located where the larva entered the stem, but it takes a sharp eye to spot these. In most cases, treatments are not recommended for this pest. On ash trees, only minor pruning of small branches occurs, and on lilacs, three to four year old canes should be removed to stimulate new growth anyway. Before the emerald ash borer arrived in North America, the banded ash clearwing was the most important borer attacking ash trees. This pest is found across North America and the adults look like dark brown wasps with yellow bands across the abdomen. The males and females are just a little over an inch long and males have more slender abdomens. 
Like many boars, the adult females tend to lay eggs on stressed ash trees or trees that have some physical damage. In street lawns and parking lots, treats are often pruned up to provide space for cars and people. The pruning scars can be attractive to this pest. This borer is a bit different than the other clear wings we have discussed. The larvae first burrows in the phloem and cambium, but it soon burrows deep into the xylem. Thus, girdling damage is uncommon with this species. The larvae push out their granular frass from entrance holes, and this can accumulate under infested trees. When the banded ash borer has matured, it will extend its burrow back to the bark surface where it chews away the bark tissues but leaves a thin window. The larva then backs down the burrow and pupates. After completing its pupal development, the pupa rotates its abdominal segments. Spines on the segment surface propel the pupa forward where it ruptures through the bark cap and the adult can then emerge. In many cases, the pupal skin remains attached to the burrow, and in other cases, this drops to the ground, and the only thing that remains is a perfectly round hole. The pheromone for this pest has also been identified, and traps can be used to determine when the adults are flying. However, keeping ash trees actively growing and damage-free is one of the best ways to prevent this pest attack. The rhododendron borer is one of the smaller clear wings, being slightly smaller than the dogwood borer. In fact, the adults look much like the dogwood borers, having yellow bands on their abdomen, but the bands occur on abdominal segments 2, 4, and 5. This pest attacks rhododendron, azalea, and mountain laurel. It overwinters as a nearly mature larva under the bark of the host. In early spring, the larvae finish feeding and pupate near an opening in the bark. The adults fly in mid-May through June. After mating, the females prefer to attach their eggs where there has been previous damage to the bark of host plants. The larvae burrow just under the bark and push out frass pellets from the holes in the bark. Most of the attacks occur at the bases of host plants. Repeated attacks often girdle branches, causing parts of the plant to suddenly wilt with the leaves rolling up and turning brown. While there are diseases that can also kill rhododendron and azalea branches, none make frass pellets. Again, pheromone traps are useful in determining adult flights and thus timing of treatments. Viburnum shrubs often have canes that suddenly wilt and die. Most assume that the plant has a vascular disease, but in many cases the death is due to the viburnum borer. This borer is about the size of the dogwood borer, but the adults have antennae with distinctive white tips. Like the rhododendron borer, most attacks occur at the base of the plant, often under the cover of mulch that has been pushed up to the plant. Healthy viburnum plants will have smooth and intact bark. This pest burrows just under the bark and often pushes out frass pellets and causes gouty growth. The boar adults emerge in May and June and the larvae overwinter in their burrows. The larvae complete their development in the spring and pupate under a flap of loose bark. Again, the pheromone for this clear wing has been identified and can be used for monitoring. The oak clear wing is also known as the hornet clear wing, red oak clear wing, and golden oak boar. The males have black with bright yellow banding, which makes them look like eastern yellow jackets. The females are more orange in color, and the banding on the abdomen is less distinct. This boar commonly attacks red and white oak species, as well as chestnuts. It seems to be most successful on older oaks that have some kind of bark damage. Like the banded ash borer, this one has larvae that burrow into the xylem area and it pushes out sawdust-like frass from the entrance hole. Healthy oaks exude sap at the wound site, which mixes with the frass and stains the bark around the burrow opening. 
The larvae usually take two years to complete development and the adults fly from May into June. Females often lay eggs on or around previous oak clearwing bores. The pheromone for this pest is commercially available, but warn people that are using the pheromone to expect something that looks like a yellow jacket to end up in the trap. The western poplar clearwing is in the same genus as the oak clearwing and the adults also look a bit like yellow jackets. This clearwing attacks willows, poplars, and aspens in the northwestern North America. The larvae can bore into trunks or branches and they generally feed in the xylem area and maintain a burrow opening to the outside. They use this opening to expel their frass pellets. In healthy trees, the frass can be mixed with plant sap, which stains the bark of the infested trees. Repeated attacks can weaken branches so that they are prone to break out when snow or ice accumulates in winter storms. Like the oak clearwing, this pest often takes two years to complete its life cycle. There are several species of clearwing moths that have larvae that specialize in feeding on gall or callus tissues of trees and shrubs. The maple callus borer is a very pretty but small species that feeds on maple callus tissues that form where branches are pruned or broken. It doesn't cause major damage, but its larva can cause sap flow and bark discoloration. A really unusual species is the oak gall clearwing. This species has larvae that feed on the gouty and horn beak galls of red oaks. I got this image when I clipped off a gouty oak gall and brought it in to see the gall wasp emerge. While I got the gall wasp pictures, this also emerged much to my surprise.